inspire many to improve their health through ketogenic nutrition. In the book Keto Continuum, Dr. Bosworth used David's story to teach you how to stay consistently keto. David was obese, depressed, and headed for a heart attack. Keto is through storytelling. Dr. Boz, tell us a story. Excited to be here. I have been uh, on a plane since Wednesday, hopping around and being present for family in South Dakota. So I thought I would wear boots and a Harley jacket to say I came from my home state. <laughs> so I have a couple of disclosures. I make money when you guys buy books. Thank you for buying books. Thank you for writing reviews. I do not know what I mean, Western medicine delivered best. Her chronic lymphocytic leukemia meant that her immune system attacked her white blood cells, and the first two rounds of chemo took her brain offline so much that the woman who made all of my clothes until the age of 10 didn't know what a sewing machine was after the second round of chemo. And the third round came, her white blood cells were 1 in 50 were working, she had a life expectancy of 6 months, and she said, I'm not doing it. I've given you two chances. I'm not any healthier than I was 10 years ago. I can't get this weight off. I can't remember the Rolodex in my brain to say, pap smears, can't find her. Pizza, can't find her. I don't know this woman. But in South Dakota, and their windows are frozen, so I said, well, yes, get in. So she hops in my car, and she fills the seat and the space in my car with, I have been calling to become your patient. And I'm like, pay the front staff more. <laughs> I just got out of the hospital. She's from Brazil. She has a really thick accent. I have to concentrate to hear what she's saying. They took out my colon cancer. Do you know what they fed me in hospital? Pudding. They fed me pudding. And she's shoving the book in my face. I need to be your patient. I said, my staff will kill me. This book came out and I, I have a waiting list that I, I can't see all these patients. We're working 16 hour days when we don't, have, we don't have the manpower to do any more patients. And then she said something that really struck home. She said, well then you need to lead a class and I will be your student. <coughs> That David didn't know his labs, but his statistics of having a heart attack were, were the highest in the country. And although this is what our country looks like, the one test that he had in a very abnormal range links to all of those in red. And if he would lower this one lab, he could decrease the risk of all of them. This is not a genetic problem. This is absolutely a choice that he is making. He just doesn't know it yet. And as he enters that classroom, I was going to teach how to, to lower this lab without ever mentioning that this was the lab directing his life expectancy. So we are going to do this teaching. My objective is to, well, do you remember Mrs. Uh, the, Mrs. Fuzzy's, Mrs. Fuzzle. Frizzle. Frizzle, thank you. Yes, I'm like that. Fuzzle is actually my son's second grade teacher, and I did that in second grade. <laughs> Mrs. Frizzle's magic school bus. So we are about to hop on one. We are going to go into your bone marrow, where red blood cells are made. These red blood cells are disc shaped, and they are unique. They do not have mitochondria, they do not have a nucleus, but they are the focus of the test that. All of you should absolutely know what your number is. And we mix a few things to make, um, to make these structures. There's some cholesterol, there's some protein, there's some iron. But these strings are called globin. There's four of them. And those yellow shaped discs are heme. We're going to drop some iron into the cups of those heme. And now we have hemoglobin that are found inside your red blood cells. The number one single purpose of red blood cells is to carry oxygen and deliver it throughout your body. 
Those four seats to carry oxygen are dependent on you not having a mess inside your red blood cells. As you look at the parking spots for these oxygen, they will be attracted to the iron at the bottom of that heme, and they'll stay in that seat until there is another cell that has a higher force for the oxygen than uh, the after red blood cells. So let's take a look. We're going to talk about a hundred seats in your red blood cell. Now your red blood cell has many more than that, but we're going to talk about a hundred of them. As we park our oxygen molecules into these hemoglobin spots in your red blood cell. That will start at your lungs and go to the place where you fill your seats. So take that deep breath in. Everybody just filled a few more red blood cells and you even know what's just happening. So, he had a bad knee from an injury years ago that he just thought was part of being 62 years old. Never to be reversed. I believe that ligament in his knee had been glycated. The sugar in his body not only was gumming up a bunch of his yellow cups that are supposed to hold oxygen, it was gumming up those little bones in his ears. His hearing was really diminished in one ear. It was also the same year that he had had chronic ringing of the ears for nearly 25 years. That glycation is the word that we use when the gum sticks to things. And as much as we're focused on these red blood cells and the oxygen cups and the hemoglobin cups, it's happening all throughout your body. Glycation is a problem. And when we displace an oxygen for the glucose, it links to your mortality. So here's Mr. Glucose taking away one of our spots. But I like this specifically. And I want you to think of this in your brain. Those cells need oxygen. But if you don't deliver the predictable number of oxygen molecules, well, nobody writes you a memo, but those cells shut down. Their mitochondria turn off. And if you leave them alone long enough without enough oxygen, they start to disappear. We have things like a leaky gut, one of my least favorite terms. But it is permeable to things that it shouldn't be. And so is the blood-brain barrier. When those oxygen molecules are not routinely delivered, things happen and nobody tells you. So let's take a look at the oxygen, uh, yeah, how glycated is your hemoglobin? That really is what we're going to talk about here today. Who will he lift? And he is wiry. Dang, is he wiry. Uh, has a ton of energy. But the orphanage has three meals a day. This is, we went on this trip just last year, actually. It has three meals a day. There is no evening eating. And when I checked Willie's blood sugar uh, during the day, it was in the 65 to 70 range uh, until he ate. And then it went up to just under 100 because the portion sizes in the orphanage were small, but thankfully not too processed. He then uh, was able to have an eating window that was only during daylight hours, and his average blood sugar was, yeah, he was used for my So that's uh, somewhere just, just north of 70. If you were to look at a continuous glucose monitor and a continuous ketone monitor, you would see that he makes and uses glucose mostly during the day and ketones mostly during the night. As the floor of his ketones doesn't go all the way back to zero. This is a metabolically flexible person. And, oh, he's lean. There is not an ounce of fat on him. He's using most of the energy he stores during the day. <laughs> most of the energy he stores during the day. Um, and he is recruiting any fat into ketones when he sleeps. His, uh, 10-year-old, uh, oh, this, was, this is what it would look like over four days. When you watch the cyclical nature of what our metabolic systems were designed to do, they are to use glucose first, but have a quick response to using ketones as soon as that energy is no longer quickly available. <clears throat> All right, 
So if we take his hemoglobin in years, not because he isn't trying. He is trying to lose weight. He has tried to exercise. But the amount of activity it would take to reverse this chemistry set would be an exercise of several days without eating before I could get his insulin low enough. And God forbid he would drink a sports drink while exercising. He would reverse the chemistry and we would never get a fat cell burn uh, with where he's at now. This hemoglobin A1C was seven, an average of 154. At eight, we go up to 183. At nine, we're over 200. At 10, David was in the double digits. He's now got an average blood sugar of 240. 269. Unfortunately, the charts go all the way up to 16. I'm just going to let you scroll through this as I, as you try to remember what is your average blood sugar. Keep in mind that we don't measure this in whole numbers. We take this out to like the fifth digit, but you don't ever see that on the lab. But this is how we say, well, what is your average blood sugar? And how well are you delivering oxygen to those brain cells, to that left knee that's been inflamed, to the inner ear that's ringing and has for 25 years? David did not like doctors. As he came to the support group, he never did see me as a patient. These labs were done because his wife dragged him kicking and screaming to get labs checked. And he was able to take that A1C from double digits down to 5.2 within four months. No, no, six months, six months, two checks. He did that because he was thankfully at the time when his body could respond. Two more months, I would have predicted he couldn't have reversed it that quickly. It was just God's timing that he was able to do that. Thank you. When are you going to do the brains? Oh, when I do the brains, but did my husband be? So, uh, yeah. The, the brain's book is something that I, I just keep thinking, if you write a book, it needs to be something that there is not already out there. And although the brain's course, which is, if I have to say something on my resume that I love the most, it, there's a ton of work that I've done for the military, but the 12-hour uh, the brain's course in teaching the leaders on how to really help people get their brains to work right, uh, which is how I landed on the ketogenic diet that I was listening to a podcast where they were doing everything that I was doing. Uh, the sleep training, the, the family therapy, the trauma, the TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, all of that. But they were doing it on a bed of ketones. And those brain repairs, whether the trauma was emotional or physical from these military uh, soldiers, it was so much faster than I was able to get. I was jealous. And I, of course, it's something that the Department of Defense paid me to do for until COVID, and then it all fell in. So yes, my husband does say, you know, my, both my books are stories. I think you learn best when I teach through stories, and I have probably 400 patients that would make a great story. But I'm not done. <laughs> Thanks for the money, I appreciate it. This whole community is, what the audience I used to talk to were using, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, alcohol for their addiction. And welcome aboard. <laughs> we all have it. But they have a, uh, an anticipation response where the cortisol does stimulate the release of glucose. Uh, that has been reproduced more than, I mean, it's impressive to me. Uh, I mean, it, it truly is a part of, you can't address uh, this metabolic issue if you leave the psychology aside. And I, I love outcomes. Uh, one of the saddest moments for my career in, uh, in addiction was to look back and say, what was it that I did for these patients who were five years out from a drink, five years out from crystal meth, five years out from porn addiction? Was it the medicine I used? Was it the timing of the therapist? Was it my, my very motivating speaking? No. It was, did they, did they attend group? And did they consistently 
stay coming to support groups. 